Each of them took 200 pictures. Oh. Look at the solar flares. Wow. I mean, they were right under the total. She said that it went black, totally black. <laughs> pretty awesome. Amazing. Yeah, it is. Well, good morning, everyone. My light on? It is on. Last week I brought a message on that we, we need to be about God's plan of reconciling people. Our, our nation is so divided. We are so separated politically, racially, and, and in so many ways. Um, if you didn't happen to get the mess or hear the message, I'd urge you to go online and check it out. Uh, but I mentioned then that there was a booklet that would be coming out that uh, it's here. I have it now. It's called Hard Conversations, Reflecting Jesus While Facing the Issues. And uh, I want to recommend you uh, this to you. I want you to think about what how do we do this? How do we talk to our friends and our neighbors? our relatives, or even on, on social media in such a way as that we are uniters rather than dividers. There's so much heat and light out there right now. There's not a, there's not a lot of, of, of uh, serenity, peace coming together. How many of you know God is not a divider? God is a uniter. God is breaking down walls. He's not separating people. And uh, we need to be about our Father's business. Uh, now, obviously, we can hold opinions strongly. Uh, but like we said last time, opinions are like noses. Everybody's got one, right? What we need more than anything else is the, uh, the Spirit of God, the Kingdom of God. And we need to be carriers of that. So, so I, I just commend this to you and uh, hope you will uh, check it out and grow and learn thereby. So, so this morning we are continuing our, our series um, on the life of Jesus, walking with Jesus. How many of you know Jesus changes everything? When he comes, everything changes. And this series is, uh, we're kind of working our way through the Gospels. Uh, we're not in a hurry. We're not trying to go a, a, in a verse-by-verse verse exegesis of all of the New Testament, all of the Gospels. But what we really want to do is uh, zero in on this ministry of this, of this man from Galilee. What an amazing thing he's, he has and has done. And we looked last time um, on Jesus' temptation in the wilderness and his victory, because Jesus' victory is our victory. Amen? And we want to look at today Jesus' mission statement. Jesus' mission statement. So we're, gonna, we're continuing in Luke chapter 4. And you recall we left off in verse 13 when the devil had finished all this tempting. He left him until an opportune time. Verse 14, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And news about him spread through the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogue and everyone praised him. So what I, I just want to draw a couple points. First is this. Jesus did not come to start a new religion. There's plenty of religions in the world. We didn't need another one. By this time, Hinduism is already in extant, and they already have 250 million gods, okay? They don't need any more religion. But what Jesus did is he brought a new kingdom. 
And it's not really new. It is really the ancient rightful kingdom of God come back to earth. Jesus is himself the king. And he has returned to the earth that he created. And when the time was right, he brings the kingdom of God. But more than that, he teaches it. If, if, and you will see as we go through this, the primary message of Jesus is the kingdom of God. Kingdom of God is like this. Kingdom of God is like a man who did this. A kingdom of God is like a woman who did this. Kingdom of God is like this. And, and he's teaching about the kingdom of God. And more than that, and finally, he is modeling modeling what it is like to be a kingdom man or a kingdom woman to be someone it, it it's it's important that you understand that uh, there is this there is this question what did Jesus come to do why did Jesus come to earth what was his purpose what was his mission what was he doing and it's and it is it's interesting because if you read the creeds like the apostles creed and the Chalcedon creed and the other creeds it, it, it's, it's fascinating and, and creeds are these statements that the church fathers have issued explaining basically the trinity these are the creeds are essentially trinity statements and they you know I believe in God the father maker of heaven and earth and so forth and then it talks about Jesus it says I, I believe in 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 Jesus born of the Virgin Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate crucified dead and buried raised on the third day and all of the creeds tend to say that they go right from born of the Virgin Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate wait a second you've just blown past three and a half of the most important years of Jesus life there's no mention at all of his earthly ministry. So what did that mean? What was he doing? And, and as a result, I think to some extent, the tendency is to skip that, to miss something. I think the church has largely overlooked or missed something here. Now the Protestant church, the reformers, focused on the finished work of Jesus on the cross which is awesome, it's amazing, it's great. They finished on his, they focused on his finished work, his redemption, his justification, his atonement, if you will, dying on the cross, what he did for us on that cross, right? How amazing is that? He purchased us, purchased us with his blood. He has made a way by where we can be reconciled to God. He has taken away our sins and he has imputed to us his righteousness there is a sacrificial atonement there is a substitutionary atonement Jesus becomes our substitute God pours out on Jesus the wrath that should have come to us and and because of that we we become the righteousness of God in Christ hallelujah we are justified we it is just as if I'd never sinned we are forgiven and and we're given all these things in the atonement we focus on that, and that's great. And most of the Pauline epistles tend to focus on what all that means and how does all of that work out. But the question is, what was Jesus doing before the cross? In that period of time, before the cross, what's going on? That's what we want to look at because there's something key here for us as well. Yes, he, he came to reconcile us to the Father. Yes, very true. And, and we are so thankful for his shed blood on the cross, for his resurrection, which changes everything. But while he was here on earth, what was he doing? What was the purpose of all of that? What are we to make of all that? Was he just down here doing a magic show? Was, was he just down here to show us and, and make us marvel at his spiritual power? No, there's much more to it than that. What he came to do 
is bring the kingdom of God to earth. To earth. And he's, not only is he bringing this kingdom, he's teaching us all about it. What it means, how it works, how it operates, how it functions, what our relationship to each other would be like in this kingdom. And then he models what it means to be a man of the kingdom, a person of the kingdom. And so this is what we're looking at here. This is what Jesus is doing. His focus, Jesus' focus is not so much otherworldly. It is bringing the kingdom of God to this world. This is why he teaches us to pray every day. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because Jesus is interested in bringing the kingdom of God to this earth. Now, an awful lot of the church is just interested in getting people out of here as fast as we can. I mean, we are very heavenly minded and we're very, you know, interested in getting saved and going to heaven. And thank God for heaven. Thank God for salvation. Thank God for all of the provisions that God has made for us. But Jesus is also stressing and teaching the kingdom of God here on earth. So this is part of what he is doing. Verse 14, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. So, so Jesus is going around the countryside, and news about him is spreading. Verse 16, he went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And I guess the first point I, I want to make is, Jesus relies on the Holy Spirit. Think about that for a minute. He is the second person of the Trinity. This is God the Son. But he is relying on the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. That's interesting, isn't it? So we have God the Son being filled with God the Spirit. How does that work? Well, when Jesus is here on earth, Philippians 2 talks about how he, when he came, he emptied himself. And Jesus takes on himself the form of a servant and becomes born like a human being like we are. So what you're seeing is someone with two natures. Jesus is fully God, yes, but he's also fully human. And when he is born, he empties himself of, his, of the privileges of being God the Son and he becomes a human being and lives like a human being, like you and me. And he is modeling for us what it would be like to live on the earth fully surrendered to the Holy Spirit. So basically what he is showing us is not what would it look like if God came to earth. He is showing, demonstrating for us what it would it look like if a human being fully surrendered to the Holy Spirit on this earth. And that changes everything. You see the difference? So Jesus relies on the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Verse 16, he went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue as was his custom. So from the outset of his ministry and, and even before, Jesus is still continuing to go to the synagogue. And he is teaching in the synagogue. And he stood up to read. Verse 17, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and unrolling it, he found the place where it is written. Verse 18, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to recover freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Of course, he is quoting right here Isaiah chapter 61, which is one of the most beautiful passages in, in all of the Bible, Isaiah 61. I love, how many of you love Isaiah generally? Isaiah is an amazing prophetic book. And if you read most of Isaiah in the, in the early chapters, God is chastising, rebuking Israel for their sin, for their faithlessness, for their 
uh, apostasy, from falling away from God. He is rebuking them, but he is telling them that in the future, one day, I will send my servant. I will send my servant. He is predicting that there will come. All the way through Isaiah, there's this prediction, someone's coming, someone's coming. And this someone will change everything. And you can, you see, you hear the reflections here and there in different places. And I, Isaiah 9, that, that uh, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And a virgin will conceive and, and bring forth a child, and, and his name will be called Wonderful. And so we hear, we hear these echoes of a, of a future event. Somebody's coming! And he'll change everything, and it'll be magnificent. And then we get to Isaiah 53, and suddenly the mood changes. And now we have the suffering servant. And Isaiah 53, that, that you know, um, he will take upon himself our sins. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities the chastisement of our sin was laid on him and by his stripes we are healed we see this suffering servant coming and then finally Isaiah 61 the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news and Jesus stands up and he reads that Spirit of the Lord. Can you imagine? Scroll is not handed to him. Now here is the very one that was prophesied. He's coming. He's coming. He's coming. Here he is. He stands up in the synagogue. He takes the scroll. He unrolls it to Isaiah 61 and he reads this very portion of Scripture. Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Wow. Wouldn't you like to have been there that day? Wow. Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Wow, what good news, what good news. Now it's interesting, he says, he has sent me. Who is the he who is being sent? He is the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. In other words, the Trinity, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has anointed me and he has sent me. To do what? To do what? Well, first of all, to preach good news to the poor. I love this. I love this. He didn't come to the high and mighty. You know, he didn't come to the kings and the nobles. He came to the poor. We hear echoes here of Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And as you read down through these, you need to think about these things primarily as spiritual conditions, not just physical conditions. Yes, physical, but maybe first and primary, spiritual. When he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, what is he talking about? He's talking about the, the we who have come to the place, we realize that we are morally bankrupt before God. I've got nothing to commend me to God at all. Nothing in my hand I bring, only to your cross I cling. That's the poor in spirit. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Claim freedom to the prisoners. Freedom for the prisoners. Recovery of sight to the blind. To release the oppressed. And to proclaim the year of the Lord's 
favor. <laughs> the favor of God is on you. And you, and you, and you. The favor of God is on you. It's also instructive what he did not say. In Isaiah 61, the very next verse in the passage is, and the day of the judgment of our God. But he doesn't say that. He stops at the year of his favor. The reason is, judgment's coming, but it's not this day. Judgment's coming, but it's not this day. This day is the favor of God. We are in that place of you can know the favor. How many of you want to know the favor of God? I know I do. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I love this idea. And and notice how many times he's anointed to proclaim. He's anointed to speak. We think of the anointing. We think of the anointing. I want to be anointed, you know, so I can heal the sick and deliver the oppressed and do all of these things, which is of course important but the anointing is to proclaim it not just feel it not just move in a with a, a an assurance of God's presence that's important but we need to proclaim it to have an anointing without a proclamation doesn't complete the job Amen. how many of you understand there's something about speaking yes. announcing be healed be restored God loves you <laughs> stop you're going the wrong way turn around come back to God he loves you you can know the favor of God we need to be men and women of the kingdom who under the anointing of the Holy Spirit proclaim the favor of God Amen. preach good news to the poor yes. proclaim it speak it there's something about the proclamation don't be shy. Don't be. This is why we need the anointing. The anointing we get in our private time with God, in our prayer with Him, in being filled with the Holy Spirit. He will anoint you. He will anoint you not just so you feel stuff. He'll anoint you so you do stuff. And it begins with a proclamation. So this is what Jesus does. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind. How many of you know people are so bound up in their spirits? People are so bound up by demons. The first, I don't know, five years that I went to France and ministered in France, every single meeting there was a deliverance, meaning we were casting demons out of people. At the, at the close of that meeting. Every single one, I was astonished that there was that level. I mean, people would come forward to get saved. They would receive Jesus. They would respond to the proclamation. You'd lay your hands on them, and suddenly they'd start manifesting an evil spirit. We'd pray for them. That happened to our team when we were in, in France, um, I don't know, six, seven years ago. Remember, Dan? Same thing happened. Some of you were there. It's incredible. It's incredible. This is our anointing. This is, God has anointed us to do this. Right. And Jesus is modeling it for us. And I love this. Verse 20, he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began to say to him, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Verse 22, all spoke well of him and were amazed at his gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked? And Jesus said to them, surely you will quote this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. Do here in your hometown what we've heard you do, that you do in Capernaum. What I want to talk for just a few minutes is the difference between religion and relationship. So Jesus has been down in Galilee, Capernaum, and he has been ministering he has been doing all of these things, and the reputation, the stories have trickled back to his hometown, Nazareth. So Jesus is in his hometown now, 
and he is speaking like this, he is announcing his ministry, and he says this in 20, verse 24, I tell you the truth, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you there were many, many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years. There was a severe famine throughout the land, yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. In other words, <coughs> Elijah was sent to an outsider. There were many in Israel with leprosy at the time of Elisha, the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman, the Syrian. In other words, another outsider. And all of the people, verse 28, in the synagogue were furious. These are, this is his hometown. They are angry. They're furious when they heard this. They got up and drove him out of the town and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him down the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Interesting. Then he went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee. And on the Sabbath began to teach the people. They were amazed at his teaching because his message had authority. Now he's going to demonstrate. Listen. In the synagogue there was a man possessed by a demon, an evil spirit. He cried out at the top of his voice, Ha! What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, Holy One of God. Be quiet. Jesus said sternly, Come out of him. Then the demon threw the man down before them all and came out without injuring him. And all the people were amazed <laughs> and said to each other, What is this teaching? With authority and power, he gives orders to evil spirits, and they come out. And the news about him spread throughout the surrounding area. Okay, two more quick ones. 38, Jesus left the synagogue, went to the home of Simon. This is Peter. Now Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever, and they asked Jesus to help her, so he bent over her, rebuked the fever, and it left her. She got up at once and began to wait on them. Verse 40, when the sun was setting, people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness, and laying his hands on each of them, he healed them. Moreover, demons came out of many people, shouting, You are the Son of God. But he rebuked them, would not allow them to speak, because they knew he was the Christ. Verse 42, at daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. Why? To pray. To reconnect with the Father. To get recharged in the Holy Spirit. Now, if he needed that, you think we might need that too? See, everything he does, he's modeling for us. He's modeling for us. The people were looking for him, and when they came out to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent. Why was he sent? To preach the good news of the, of the kingdom of God. I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God. Everybody say kingdom of God. Kingdom of God. Let that just settle in our spirit. To the other towns also, because that's why I was saying it's interesting. In his own town, they kick him out. But at Campertium, they, please don't leave. Please don't leave. No wonder they saw so many miracles. How many of you know that when you invite Jesus in, you're going to see stuff? You're going to see stuff. It's going to change everything. But a lot of people are offended by him. See, that's the difference between religion and a relationship. Religion has some good sides to it, right? Religion isn't all bad. There's things about religion generally that are good, I guess. One thing about religion is that it opens you up to the idea of God, that there's something outside of ourselves, okay? So not all religion is wrong, and not everything about religion is evil or bad. There's plenty of religions in the world, and 
The one thing they all have in common, sort of, is that there's something out there bigger than ourselves. We ought to obey this, worship this, whatever this is, however it's defined. So there are some good things about religion. Another thing is religion can, can give you good principles. It can teach you the difference between right and wrong. Religion can be a guide for people right? So it, it can be a, something that moderates your behavior. That can be good, right? But there's also some very bad things about religion, generally. Religious people tend to be very rigid, very stiff, very uh, unbending, unyielding. They tend to be, their minds are made up. They know <clears throat> They're convinced, they have everything, they've got the truth, they know what it is. There's a certain rigidity about that. And it can quickly flash to anger if you disagree with them. And it can even be murderous. How many people have we seen murdered in the name of religion? And unfortunately, even the Christian religion. They even take Jesus out and seek to kill him. This is a murderous religious spirit. But opposed to that, you see Jesus modeling what it means to have a relationship with the Father. He's connected to God. First of all, he's filled with the Spirit. Second of all, he loves people. He, his heart beats with the heart of the Father towards these people it's his joy it's his delight it's it's his passion it's his mission to preach good news to the poor to heal the brokenhearted set at liberty the captive to bring relief for those that are blind this is the heart of God this is the heart of Jesus and if you're going to enter in to the kingdom of God you may have to say goodbye to religion you may have to let that go you've got to choose do you want religion or do you want a relationship relationship is completely different relationship is ongoing it's continual it requires give and take it requires a, a back and forth it requires a, a receiving constant renewal right Religion's kind of one and done. Okay, I know it all now. I know everything. Now my job is to go out and kill all the infidels. Relationship is, Father, fill me again. Lead me again. Anoint me again. Holy Spirit, use me in any way that you want today. How can I be used of you today, Lord? Lord, my heart beats with your heart for these people. Use me today. Come on, worship team. He said, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also because that is why I was sent and this is what he is sending us to do as well don't settle for religion go for relationship would you pray with me Father Father Abba Papa Daddy Lord, we desire to stay and remain connected to you. Lord, we clearly see that, first of all, we are in need of all of these things. We are poor in spirit. We, Lord, are bound up by the enemy and need to be freed. Lord, we are spiritually blind and we need you to set us free. Deliver us. Heal us. Restore us. 
Lord, thank you for doing that. God, I pray that you would anoint us to proclaim the good news, the kingdom of God, everywhere we go. Thank you, Jesus, for, for modeling that for us. Thank you for sending us your Holy Spirit who fills us and anoints us so that we can do the same things, Lord, that you did and touch this world. Bring others into a relationship with the Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and worship God. stories of what they think you're like I've heard tender whispers of love in the dead of night and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone you're a good perfect in all of your ways. Lord, we are perfect in exactly zero. But thank you, God, that you love us. That you love us anyway. Lord, you impute to us your righteousness that we did not earn. We thank you for it, God. We bless you, Lord. There's a prophetic word that's come. Um, so I think somebody or more than one person has an issue with your nose. And I think God wants to heal it today. So come get prayer. Amen. Amen. Yeah, and if you have any of those other things we were talking about, uh, yeah, you feel brokenhearted. You feel um, bound up in some way. Uh, we'd love to pray for you. We would love for God to uh, just release you, restore you, renew you. Would you do me a favor? Would you just put your hands out like this? I'm going to pray the Holy Spirit fill you and anoint you now. Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit. 
fill your people, Lord. Anoint us, God. Lord, you're sending us out in this world. Scary out there. All kinds of stuff. But Lord, you are the conqueror. You are the king. Lord, we want to go in your spirit, filled with you, anointed by you, God, to proclaim you everywhere we go. Preach good news to the poor. Bind up the brokenhearted. Release the captives. Recovery of sight for the blind. To proclaim the acceptable year of God's favor. God's favor. Lord, make us men and women of your kingdom, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. Come on for prayer if you'd like. Especially if you got nose stuff going on. Uh -huh.